story on Sunday for those of you who didn't hear me, but the neighbor, my neighbor that lives right across from me, father came over, I came around the back of the house and there he was coming down the driveway. I, I can't say that I said, I have ever said more than just hello to him in 20 years. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and after he got done asking me his question, it came to me that the answer is the same for all of us. If we don't live the life and we don't pass it down to the next generation, it'll die. <coughs> it will die. And uh, it's amazing that, that God has been more than gracious to us, and just blessed us. And hallelujah. I was, I was thinking during worship, I think it was last Thursday. Was it last Thursday? I, I, I mentioned that if you had one question to ask the Lord, I, I, had, I had looked at a few of the scriptures, but Jesus said, Jesus said this in John 14. He said, um, he said if, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Not that you will be blessed, but that the Father would be glorified. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I've been hacking like this for a week, and it seems like it goes away, and... All of a sudden, I get up here and start talking, and it, here it is again. It, 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 we, do have these, we do have these times, whether we like it or not, you know. Here we are, we're on the verge of getting ready for conference, and Harvey comes down and tells me, the sound system has blown up, and it looks like we got some major issues, either with these speakers up here, these two in the middle, and, uh, and our, our main amplifier that handles these two keeps blowing this channel out. So it, it looks like we're going to have to spend some money and do some decorating changes. Um, I'm, I'm sure we always like having white speakers. Most places you go don't have white speakers, but uh, those weren't always white. They were black one time until we painted them. But, uh, we may have to end up buying a new sound system before the uh, before the conference, but I'm 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 looking forward for that, and I've been asking the Lord for some hard things. I'm not asking for a good conference. Say maybe you're asking for a good conference. We have, oh baby, you know, and we we got a big budget. We meet the budget, and the presence of God's here, and, and a lot of people come and. Da, da, da. That's not really what my goal is. My goal is that, Father, we can parallel. I don't say we're going to do the same thing. But although Jesus did say this, didn't he? Greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. Didn't he say that? Well, did he mean it or didn't he? You know, I, I, ask, I like to ask these hard questions. He either meant it or he didn't mean it. So... But the issue is, his ministry really began at that 30-year mark. And, uh, I, and, and I always like to think about Caleb, you know. Caleb was 85 years old when he walked up and said, Joshua, when I was hanging out with Moses back in those days, you promised me that place, and I want to take my mountain. So, in, in, and sometimes that doesn't give a lot of hope. Especially the next generation, it's all sitting around, you know, and they're, they're, they're ready to go, you know, and, and they're ready to take over and all that stuff. And some old guy stands up here and says, I plan on hanging out here for another 40 years, you know. So. <laughs> but I believe that God is doing mighty things in our midst, and I've been asking the Lord, it's what's ahead that really counts. Amen? And... Uh, and, and, I, and I, I really do believe that we need to, to ask the Lord hard things. Um, one of the thoughts I, I had when, when uh, John was here was the fact that 
he started talking about humility. And Paul said it this way. Paul said, when we are weak, he is strong. If you can do it on your own, guess what? He'll let you. He'll just let you. But if, but if, you, if you just humble yourself and say, look, Lord, maybe you got a better way. you got a better plan. Maybe you got a better word. you got a better this. you got a better that. You know, maybe we, we need, need to set back, die to ourselves. I think, to me personally, I think that's what taking up your cross means, is you're laying down your strengths. And, and when you're a guy like me, that, that just get out of the way, I'll do it. And, it. and it makes it difficult, not only for people around you, but for the Lord himself, you know. He can't step in and do what he wants to do. So, praise God. Amen. For the past few, um, for the past few weeks, you know, I, 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 I've been trying for months all this year to, to get into the, um, the book of Philippians. It hasn't happened. I think I got about three quarters of the way through the second chapter. I really would like to talk sometime when I get the opportunity to, to talk about, Paul said about Timothy, he said, to, he said Timoth, I'm going to send Timothy to you shortly. He said, but he's a son after my own heart. And I think that's a real goal of every leader, every father. Every father in this place, his desire is to see that he can have a son after his own heart doesn't mean he does it exactly the same way, but it means he has the same heart, the same purpose, and the same direction, and that only comes out of the Spirit. And so I, I, I never got any further than that, so, and I, I can't go there tonight because that's not where God wants me to go. But the past few weeks, I've been, I've been talking about, because I'm I helped Karen with the, uh, the uh, first principle class, and I was reading um, Brother Blade's book, and he was dealing with the three dimensions of salvation, and we started talking about the second dimension, which is the mind, the will, and the emotions. The greatest hindrance to anybody's salvation lies two inches in from right here. Right here. And it's the way we think. It's how we think. Um, I've said for years, God said to the serpent, he said, um, he said, you'll crawl on your belly all the days of your life, and dust shall you eat. And he said, um, he said the seed of the woman, you might bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head while he's stepping on you. And that's the principle. But then when we get over in the book of Revelation, we find him as a big fiery red dragon. I've been in the church most of my life. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I don't know how old I was when I was dedicated, but I grew up in the church. And the devil was almost bigger than Jesus all the time I was there. The devil was always after somebody. And... Uh, we, we began to realize that all of a sudden we make the devil this big fiery red dragon. He is not our issue. It's what we think about him. If we declare him like God said is defeated, guess what? He's defeated. We still have in the church those who still believe in dual nature, what I call dual nature, that you can be an Adam and be in Christ at the same time. And the reason is, is because they haven't identified the difference between Christ and Adam. They think the flesh, because a Christian acts up in the flesh, they think he's still in Adam. That's not really true. It's just the flesh. It's just the flesh doing its thing. It's just the, the flesh, the carnality of the thing. And so when I began to talk about it last night, I, or last week, I said, well, the way we're going to find him and we're going to find out how he works is in the book. Because in Hebrews, remember, it said, low in the volume of the book, it is written of me. 
And if you really understand the Old Covenant and read in the Old Covenant, you see the picture of Christ trying to work his will in a people. And the problem was, as we read along, we got to a place that there had to be a real transformation. So salvation, I've been saved. Amen? I'm in Christ. I trust in Christ. I've been, I've been baptized in his name. But I still have screwed up a time or two. I've still had carnal thoughts. Fleshly thoughts. The word carnal in the, in the New Testament is exactly the same word is, is in, in the Greek as flesh. It's sarox. And it's the exact same word. So whether they're saying you're yet carnal, that doesn't mean you're an Adam. It means you're still fleshly minded. It's the whole story of, of the church at Corinth. The, the two letters to the church at Corinth is a whole story of those that walked as babes, as in the flesh. And so when I, when I began to look at it, I began to think about this law. I mentioned it last week, but I didn't go there. But Romans says this, and if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to, I'm not going to take long either. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Oh, I want to, I want to say this too. Because it's very difficult to teach the book of Romans in this area until you really understand. 90% of Christendom thinks Paul in chapter 7, is explaining his struggle to be a believer. That's not the truth. What Paul's explaining in chapter 7, how it was before he came to Christ, like chapter 6. Okay? And so when you get to chapter 8, it's just a continuing story of something that started back in chapter 6. And so in chapter 8, it begins with this. There is therefore now, I'm reading from the King James, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So if there, the word condemnation, we don't like that word, but it's the same basic word as judgment or no decision against. Why? Because they've been freed. Christ has already freed them. So he said, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And then it says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. If you read some of the other translations and other the manuscripts, that portion of statement was not there in the original. It's a truth, but that portion was not there. It's a, it's, it, it was brought up from verse 4 and instituted by one of the scribes into verse 1. There is therefore no condemnation, no judgment against them that are in Christ Jesus. Let me give you a little example. There's this great... Um, thought that's gone, especially in the charismatic world in the past 50 years, of the charismatic world, there's this great statement that says, you cannot judge. Jesus said, judge not. That is not what Jesus said. Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged by the same measure or the same meat by which you judge. The, the basic thought there is, he said, don't condemn. Because you're going to be judged by the same measure that you judge the other person. Have you got the picture? And so we, when we read the book of, of 1 Corinthians, Paul said this about judgment. He said to them, he said, you know, we got this problem in the church. And um, you got this guy in there. He's one of the leaders of the church. And... Um, He's, he's having um, an illicit relationship with his stepmother. 
and you're all for it. That's basically what he's saying. And you're all for it. And he said, it's, he, he gives them the whole picture, it's not right. So then he said, well, this is what I want you to do. He said, uh, I want you all to get together and I'm going to send my spirit there. And we're going to judge such a one. For I've already judged it. And he said, I've turned him over to Satan. Listen to me. For the destruction of the flesh. The flesh. That the soul might be saved in the day of judgment. Now explain that to me. To me, that sounds like pretty strong judgment. But the whole goal in the end was that the soul might be saved in that day or in the end. The goal wasn't destruction of the individual. The goal was destruction of the flesh so that the soul might be saved in the day of judgment. That's pretty strong judgment. Now here's a, here's a man, born again, spirit-filled, because every one of those churches, because Paul, the first argument they had in there was about who baptized who and in what name. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we come to Romans, we have this picture that if we're going to get this second dimension of salvation working in our life, where, where our mind gets Transform, gets changed. <coughs> There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life. There is a law. It's a spirit law. <coughs> Excuse me. You got a cough drop. I got water. That's not going to help. Anyway, <clears throat> for the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Well, what if you've been set free from the law of sin and death? You've, you, you've apprehended that aspect by faith. But you still haven't applied it, still haven't got it working in your innermost. It isn't fully, fully comprehended in your brain. <coughs> Thank you, bud. I got a whole bunch of them in the car. <coughs> Now, there is a law of sin and death. But there's another law, a greater law, a higher law. It's the law of the spirit of life. You see, Pastor, you're constantly working after this thing. Well, listen, I live with people. I find more people... You know, I'm not out there in the world. <coughs> Paul said something about the world. He said it this way. He said, if you have a brother that's in fornication, he said, don't eat with them. But he said, that doesn't mean out the people out there in the world. He said, if you go out there, you wouldn't be able to go out. He said, somebody in the, in the house, in the church, in, the, in this kind, he said, don't fellowship with them. The whole purpose there was the fact is if they're cut off from fellowship. If you go to the Roman church, what do they call it? They call it excommunication. They felt that if you put them off or put them out, they would be so deeply hurt or pierced inside that they would return. Because it's all about how we think. Here we go. There's this law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law, the law of sin and death, could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Where was it weak? 
It was not weak in the spirit. Because if you read back in chapter 7, he said the law was spiritual. It was me who was carnal. It was me who was fleshly. I was born a flesh man with Adam's nature. The time came when I knew what it was to be delivered from the old man, the old nature. But that does not mean that I still don't have some crazy carnal thoughts now and then. And if you say you don't, you lie and do not the truth because... Don't tell me you haven't had a lot of things that have come up have been more important in your mind for days or weeks or whatever it is than the things of God. We all can get wrapped up. And that isn't the problem. If you don't think people don't get wrapped up in stuff, just come over and help me with my bathroom, will you? Now, the, what the law couldn't do, it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He didn't send him as a, as a fallen spirit. He did not send him in Adam's way. He was not Adam when he walked in the flesh. He was in the likeness. Remember what Mark Hamby used to say? It's a like-as prisoner principle. Everything is a like as principle. He didn't say it was. He said the kingdom was like as. Jesus was not a sinner. He was like as. He never took our sin till he yielded on the cross. And the likeness of sinful flesh and, in, and for sin, or because of sin, or for the purpose of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now you know, you know, you that have been around here long enough, my issue about sin, there's many, it, it takes many dimensions. Stephen likes this one, this, this uh, what, what was it? Selfish individual nature. Selfish individual nature. Okay? That's one, that's one thought. And if you tell me there are not people in here that are selfish, I can come down here and point a few of you out. That your life is all about you. Selfish individualistic nature. Jesus died not only for the sin man, the Adam man, but he died for the selfish individualistic thoughts that we have. Sin also means to miss the mark. A lot of Christians think the mark is dying and going to heaven. Just dying and going to heaven. That's all the goal. That's all they live for, is dying and going to heaven. Believers are going to die and go in Christ. But the issue is, we still got to deal with this flesh man as we walk. And I'm going to tell you something I found out about the flesh man. He can get really religious. Oh, man, can he get religious. Now listen to this. For what the law could not do, it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, or because of sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law, what was the law? The law was righteous. It was spiritual. It was given by God. He wrote it on tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. But that was more than the law. There was behavioralist patterns that went on beyond all of that. There were all, thou shalt, 
You know, it didn't say, it didn't say in, in the Ten Commandments, it didn't say, thou shalt not lie with a woman when she's in her menstrual period. It didn't say that, but at someplace else it did. Or other things similar. And he said he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. <laughs> How's that going to happen? It's going to happen when we make up our mind, beloved, that God, whatever your mouth speaks, whatever your mouth declares, I'm going to put it to work in my life. Because that's his purpose. That's, that's what this second salvation, second dimension of salvation is all about. I don't have time to go into 1 Corinthians and talk in chapter 15 about all that. But the whole thing is dealing about when this corruptible, which is our mind, our thoughts, our thought life, and all that. When this corruptible puts on incorruption, then this mortal will put on immortality. It's almost like an automatic, you know. If you get this thing straightened out, guess what? This thing will just come along. Now they that are after the flesh, now listen to this. He's not, just talk, he's not talking about the world. He's eight chapters in to the book of Romans. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally or fleshly minded is death. Guess what it'll do? It'll kill you. It'll kill you. You know, uh, I heard... Uh, Somebody say something about being depressed. Brother Kelly, this is what Brother Kelly used to say. You all know what depression is? It's just a grave with both ends kicked up. A life full of depression has not focused on the realm of the spirit. There are people who struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle with things like this and, and have all these things and they never can overcome. They can't conquer all these things because they've forgotten that Jesus said some very positive things like, I'll never leave you for nor forsake you. If he doesn't ever leave you or forsake you, my God, who cares about all the rest? It isn't that you don't love people. And it isn't God doesn't join you to people. But the issue is, if he's not the game and the goal and the purpose, because he's the imparter of the spirit, you don't have that all yourself. You just don't jump up out of your spirit realm into your brain. He's an imparter. The Bible says it is the word of God that is quicker and sharper than any two-edged sword, even reaching down to, to the joints and marrows, or, and the, the dividing of soul and spirit, that dividing line. What is, what, is, what is the dividing line? What is the work of the Word of God? Either, either the living Word, which Jesus is, or the Spirit of God that enlightens you with this Word, which Jesus is, it comes to that part of your soul and your spirit. It isn't there to separate. It's there to tear down the wall that's in between so that the spirit and the soul become married and become one. That's what brings us this second dimension of salvation. I was saved. I'm being saved. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is what? It's life and peace. 
It's what? It, come on, come on, listen to me. I'm, I'm going to quit here in a minute because I could stop right here and all of us would have to take a serious look. How's your day? It doesn't say life and peace when you come to church. How's your day? How's your kids treating you, moms? How's the guy you're working with? It is, he may treat you terrible, but how is it with you? Is it life and peace? I can't change that scripture. It says to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Maybe the other side of the coin is if there's no peace and there's no life, maybe we're not spiritually minded. The key word was maybe. Because the carnal or the fleshly mind is enemy or enmity. It's a host the word the word enmity in the Greek means to be hostile. I, you know, God's got a plan. Here, here's the picture. Let me ask you this. When Israel came up out of Egypt, you know. They come, across, they come across the Red Sea, and at their first stop, it was an 11-day journey to the Promised Land. And God said to them, take a right-hand turn. And they went three days of that 11 down in the wilderness of S-I-N. That's what it says. Now, don't tell me that they were so ignorant of the fact where the promised land was. They had been waiting for 430 years to go there. They knew where the promised land was. Why in the world is God taking me this way when the direction is that way? That's hostility to God's plan. If God says he's taking you there, he's taking you there. But he may not go by your map. You may Google it. You may do whatever you want to do, but God's plan is always to get you there. But he's going to get you there so that you're equipped to be in the place that he's taking you to. Because we never recognize the fact there may be some adjustment needed in my life. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Neither can it be. Now the law of God is what? It's not the old law of the old covenant. It's this law of peace. This law of life. This law of living the peaceful life. Oh God. It gets quiet in here. Why does it get so quiet in here when all you do is read the word? Hmm. It's not, it's not subject to the law of God, neither can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Why not? Why not? Here's why. I, I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the church. I'll tell you why. Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And don't let him think that he's going to get anything from God. So where's your mind got to be set? It's not your spirit. It's your mind. Your mind has got to be set on Him. Your mind has got to be set on the directions of the Spirit. Your mind has got to be flowing in the realm of the Spirit. But guess what? God may not be taking you in the way you want to go. He's saving you from yourself. But ye are not in the flesh. Now isn't that amazing? 
He goes through all of this and he tells us, but if you're a child of God, you're really not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. There's the key. Dwell in you. Dwell in you. You know what dwell means? This word here, this word dwell, this has a form, formation in it, and, and the meaning primarily is it's like he owns the place. You know? He comes in from whatever he's doing. If he don't feel like wiping his feet, he don't wipe his feet. He goes in, sets in the easy chair, and he don't expect to come home and have the furniture all rearranged. That's what the word dwell means. If the Spirit of God dwell in you, it means he owns the place. He can have it any way he wants it. So if the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's not of him. It's, the King James says none of his, but it says he's not of him. There are a lot of professing Christians that do not know what it is to have the indwelling Christ. They're followers of Jesus. They're believers in Jesus. But they don't know what it is to have the Spirit of Christ indwelling. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. <coughs> I'm still living. I'm still breathing. I'm still walking. If God wanted us all dead, when you baptize people, you just hold them down. <laughs> if that's the way God wanted it. We've got to have a, a total different understanding of the way we got it. You know, I mean, he didn't go out and just say, get them all saved and then chop their heads off. Or take them to the waters of baptism in Jesus' name and, and just die unto the old man. Just hold the old man down till he don't breathe no more, till there's no more bubbles. That isn't what he means. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. In other words, we live in this, this body. This, this, we call it flesh. But when the Bible is talking about flesh, he's not talking about this. He's talking about this, this mind. And if Christ be in you, the body is, because of, is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him, I love this part, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Do what? If he lives in you, he owns you. He has full reign in you. He puts his chair wherever he wants it. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal body. I live today. I realize, <clears throat> excuse me, that this mortal body, he's not talking about after you die. A mortal body is a body that's still alive, subject to death. Somebody that's laying in a grave is a dead body. They are not a mortal body. This is a mortal flesh. This is a mortal body. But if the Spirit of Christ that lives in us, He can make alive this mortal body. Now, I never realized that when I was younger and stupid. But I realized that every day of my life, I'm here because of Him. You say, oh, everybody lives to 75 or 80 nowadays. Just give them enough medicines and whatever. Wait a minute. (laughs) 
Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He shall raise, he shall also quicken your mortal bodies by or through his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, I'm about to quit. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Say, I'm in debt. Now, Paul said to owe no man. He said, owe no man. But we're debtors. Not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you'll die. But if ye through the Spirit do put to death, mortify, put to death, the deeds of the body, you shall live. You do what? You do what? How many in here want to live? Because the Bible says, we are saved by his, his what? His what? His what? I believe in the cross. I think that's the answer. But if he just died, There'd be no salvation. There's salvation because he's resurrected. There's salvation because his spirit is still working in us. There's salvation going on inside of us because of indwelling life of Christ. We are saved by his life. Therefore we are dead as... Verse 13, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you live through the Spirit and do, if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led of the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So, I, I, I only want to go to a couple. I could preach the whole thing, but I don't want to. For as many are led of the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you, you have received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have re, received the spirit of adoption. It's probably one of the worst translated words in the Bible. The word is weathasian. It means the placing of a son. But it does not mean it does not mean that you go into another family, take out a child, get your adoption papers, and he becomes your son. That is not what it means. You're already a son. It's what the Jews call bar mitzvah, son of promotion, bar mitzvah. It's adoption. It's weathasian, the word weos is the Greek word that means maturity or the placing of a son. That's exactly what it means. When, when um, Jesus was at the waters of baptism and the voice came and said, this is my beloved son, the word was weos. This is my mature, complete son. That's a picture of what he's t- Paul's talking about here. In chapter 8, he was already the son of God. But at the waters of baptism, when he came forth, he was placed as a functional expression of God the Father and the planet. What is God giving us? He's trying to get our minds settled in Christ. We get our minds settled in Christ. If we allow that Christ's thoughts to begin to come in our, ourselves, then God places us as sons. Only a son can really do the work of the Father. Only the son. That doesn't leave you ladies out. That's a, in Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither... I can quote the scripture too. You know, I understand the whole principle. But the principle is, it's this, it's this daily life, this, this everyday life that we walk in, that we do, that we need to learn to walk in the spirit. So God can fully save us 
right here. Amen. Right the way we think. Because yeah, well, what happens is, you know something, what we think comes out our mouth. Mm-hmm. Out of the abundance of heart, the mouth. You all right? That's the way it is. If you're full of the Spirit, guess what's going to come out? Truth. Usually what, out, what we think is truth is the way we see it. And that's all limited by your pattern of thought. But when this Spirit of Christ begins to live through us and in us, guess what? It's going to produce life and peace. Amen? Amen. It's going to do what? Life and peace. I don't know about you. I love life and I like peace. I love life and I like peace. Father, I just thank you tonight for this people. Lord, I pray for those that are not here, that are here and there and traveling over the country and all over the place. Father, we pray that you'll be with them, that you'll guide them, you'll direct them, you'll comfort them. Father, every one of us, let us desire, Father, to allow you to be at home in us. That, Father, we might think as you think. We might talk as you talk. And we might also see as you see, Father. For truly, Father, you do all things well. You've already seen the end before the beginning. Help us, God. Help us, God, to see the finished product in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name. And everyone said...